2020, there were 27,437 incidents in which people with mental health concerns and or substance abuse disorders in Maricopa County were also diverted away from the criminal justice system and into treatment. This approach is part of the Crisis Intervention Team, or CIT, program. Joining me to share more insight is Franco Halloran, a Crisis Service Coordinator for Mercy Care. Frank, good morning to you. I love what you're doing. Love what you're doing. Hey, good morning. The mental health and comorbidity of addiction. I mean, when I look at homeless people on the street, I always think we need a program for these people. Right. And this is a this is a good program to get them connected to services or uh, reconnected with the services that they have. OK, so you're a retired police officer, correct? I am. And were you seeing a lot of this in, you know, in, in the police force in terms of the clientele that you were arresting or that you were being called on to help? Yeah, I, I sure was. Uh, in the 25 years that I served with the city of Scottsdale, I was a hostage crisis negotiator with the SWAT team for 10 years and then the CIT coordinator for nine. So I saw a lot of it. And of course, a lot of my time was spent uh, on the road, as it's, as, it's cur- as it's called. You know, really since the early 1970s, since the deinstitutionalization, uh, police have been the, the de facto crisis response for behavioral health crisis response for folks. Mm-hmm. And uh you know, unless a person is a danger to themselves or danger to others, it's really the wrong response. Mm-hmm. So what is CIT exactly and how does it work? So it, CIT stands for Crisis Intervention Team. And police training is just one component of it. And that is just uh, the 40-hour training, which kind of kicks it off for the individual officer. But for the community at large, there's four, there's four other components. So we like to think of it as a five-legged stool mm. uh, that's very stable. And the other four, you need a robust crisis system, one that's vibrant and accessible, and in particular, one that has an overall door policy for the officers and firefighters, any public safety that has someone who's in a behavioral crisis and they want care mm. uh, or they need care. Mm. And that no wrong door means if we happen to uh, bring that person to the wrong wrong door, the wrong place, uh, they we will handle it as a system, we will handle it for the officer. We don't turn officers away ever. Mm-hmm. Can you think um, of a, can you think of a, an example that, you know, the CIT program has actually helped the police force? Oh, uh, well, it, it definitely help, happens, helps in individual ways. And it also helps uh, the individuals themselves, but mm-hmm. it also helps the community at large because the, uh, another leg of that stool is a community collaboratives is that, so police officers and behavioral health providers get in the same room, uh, f- once a month for at least an hour and a half, and we discuss current issues, concerns, education, and anything that might be related to, uh, that crosses the two systems, the intersection of the behavioral health and the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. I can imagine when you were out actually working as as an officer, how frustrating it must have been so often when you came upon, you know, addicts, drug addicts, intoxicated people, mental health, and then there was, I guess back then there was probably nothing, nothing you could do for them, right? So back in the day, there were very, very few, very few resources. Uh, in the past 15 years, there's been quite a bit of uh, increase in access to services, and definitely over the last five years. But yeah, back in the day, you know, there was a, there was essentially nothing. Mm-hmm. How did Mercy Care get involved? So Mercy Care has an obligation to provide this for the community uh, to work with police officers and and firefighters, any public safety. Uh, to ensure that there is a, uh, a seamless transition from the person who is in a behavioral crisis and a, a engaging them with the appropriate level of care and also diverting them from uh, the criminal justice system as well. Mm-hmm. You know, I think often I've had debates with friends and people in my life of, you know, they don't have to be homeless. They don't have to live on the street They're, You know, if they could just get a job, but it's not so true. I mean, I know, I know mental health and there is, you know, true mental illness out there. What do you have to say to people that are maybe, you know, driving by the homeless saying they could just get a job? It's hard. Um, I don't know if if anybody has ever had to live with depression. Mm -hmm. No one wants to be, no one wants depression. No one wants to feel that way. And you can start there. And certainly someone who has some of the more, more severe illnesses, such as schizophrenia, bipolar one, where there's psychosis involved, and no one wants to be in psychosis. Yeah. No one wants to break with reality. And that's what you're looking at. Yeah. Frank, thank you so much for sharing this to do with th- today. And thank you so much for doing what you're doing to help, to help people. Well, you're welcome. Thank you. Have a great day. You too.